Empowering the next generation of computing researchers has been part of our mission since Microsoft Research was founded in 1991. Since then, we've supported over 1,300 fellowship recipients around the world. To continue this tradition, I'm proud to announce the fellowship recipients for 2021. They come from dozens of universities and reflect a broad range of fields, from computer vision and human-computer interaction to ecology and economics. We'll hear from a few of them in this short video. about machine learning research that can also accelerate progress in synthetic biology. By designing new protein sequences, we might be able to engineer enzymes to clean up environmental pollutants. Microsoft Research cares a lot about the problems that we are working on. That vision we have from science fiction movies of humans interacting with uh, complex 3D data around them and discussing it with others is becoming closer and closer. I hope with my work to help make them uh, more useful and more intuitive to people. Being able to get feedback from researchers at Microsoft so early in my career as a scientist is going to be a huge opportunity. My research purpose is to enhance the machine with human-like reasoning ability. I hope the machines can better assist humans to solve difficult reasoning tasks like debates, reliable medical diagnosis, or solving mathematical problems. My work aims to reduce the carbon footprint of data centers while improving their security. Today, we count more than 8 million of data centers worldwide against only 500,000 in 2012. Being a Microsoft Research PhD Fellow is a real honor for me and a great recognition of the importance of my PhD work. To our recipients, I'd like to personally say congratulations. I'm looking forward to the impact that you and your work will have. For all of you watching, I encourage you to check out the website to learn about all of our recipients. Hi, I'm Kevin Scott, CTO of Microsoft. Thank you all for joining us today. Let me start by first congratulating our newest PhD fellowship recipients. Welcome to the Microsoft Research Community. This research summit is the first time we've convened the global science and technology research community at this kind of scale. We did this to reflect the challenges we face today as a global society. These problems are much, much bigger than any single institution can handle alone. So addressing challenges through research and technology is going to require us to come together in new ways, crossing traditional boundaries to create the greatest possible impact. For 30 years, Microsoft has invested in rigorous scientific research and ambitious long-term thinking. As we look forward to the next decade, we want to build on that foundation to not only continue solving problems in the computing sciences, but to use computing to help solve planet-scale challenges like pandemic response and climate change, and ultimately to create a more resilient, sustainable, and healthy global society. In this closing plenary, Satya and I will reflect on what research means to Microsoft and to the world, and we'll look forward to some of the research breakthroughs that may be just over the horizon. But first, I'm going to speak with Max Welling, VP and Distinguished Scientist, about what he's working on at our new Microsoft Research Amsterdam Lab. I'm joined today by Max Welling, VP and Distinguished Scientist, Microsoft Research Amsterdam. I'm super excited to have the opportunity to talk with Max about some of the incredible advances that are taking place in molecular simulation and the biosciences fueled by recent progress in AI and machine learning. Max, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Kevin. It's be, I've been delighted to be here. So I wanted to start by uh, just sort of asking you to give us a brief overview of your career and what you're doing right now uh, that you've joined Microsoft and, and started the MSR Amsterdam lab. Yeah, sure. I started out as a physicist. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, quantum gravity. Um, and interestingly, uh, it seems I'm going full circle because I'm coming back now as, well, a physicist or maybe, you know, a machine learning driven chemist of some kind. Um, but in the middle, I did a very large detour, uh, learning machine learning and contributing to that field. So I, after my PhD, I went to Pasadena, to Caltech, 
uh, learning computer vision and machine learning. I came to uh, university, came back to London actually to do uh, a postdoc with Jeff Hinton, who is sort of the inventor of uh, deep learning um, on uh, machine learning. And then I went to the University of Toronto. I went cycled back to Pasadena or to, to uh, La Los Angeles to uh, be on the faculty of the University of California. And then in 2012, I came back to the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands as a professor in machine learning. Um, I started a startup right after that, got acquired by Qualcomm. I spent four years there building the AI lab for Qualcomm. And um, I was about ready to start a, another startup in molecular simulation. And then I got the call from Chris, which made me, which, who convinced me to join Microsoft. That's awesome. And so I, I just wanted to ask again, you've had such an amazingly interesting career in this rich history across both academia and industry and startups. What was it that drew you to come to work at Microsoft? Well, as I said, I was, I was actually starting a startup, and the reason was that I saw the enormous potential in a molecular simulation uh, that was uh, developing in the field. So m machine learning was making an enormous impact um, in the field of molecular simulation. Um, they were using our models, and I thought this is the perfect time to, to, uh, to move into that field. Um, and then, you know, I got the call from Chris Bishop, who said, well, we're going to move to Amsterdam. Um, do you want to join us on molecular simulation? And um, I had to think a little bit, but it, what convinced me was that Microsoft has uh, an enormous uh, sort of uh, compute power behind it to really make a dent in this problem. So molecular simulation is, is incredibly compute hungry. And in order to really make an impact, you really need that compute power behind you. Also, of course, there is an amazing research culture here and lots of very, very smart colleagues that I can work with. Um, and maybe last but not least, there is the sort of pledges from Microsoft to work on sustainability problems. And that was something that I really wanted to work on. I'm seeing that you know it's our generation basically that has been pushing out the carbon into the air, and I feel it's our our duty to also take some out. And I and I saw that Microsoft basically committed to become carbon neutral uh, or actually negative by 2030, and have taken out all the carbon that they ever produced in 2050. And I was deeply inspired by that by that uh, commitment, and so that that made me join Microsoft. Yeah, and we are so glad to have you here. I think it's one of those uh, really lucky coincidences for uh, for us, at least, and hopefully for you. Um, because we, we have been seeing the world, I think, in approximately the same way that you have. The, you know, the obvious things over the past handful of years is that scale in perception uh, deep neural networks and in natural language deep neural networks and even with reinforcement learning with strategic game playing and whatnot uh, results in uh, really interesting solutions to problems. So the bigger you can scale models and the more computation you can throw at these things, uh, not just, uh, you, you, you not only get uh, better solutions to problems that you know that deep neural networks can already solve, but you are able to solve things with these networks that you didn't really anticipate. And so like that, that uh, return on scale has been obvious, but the thing that we've been seeing, and, and like I think this is especially interesting given your background and interest, uh, is that uh, for several years now we've been seeing that the models themselves when you uh, use them to try to understand something about the deep structure of these scientific domains you can use the same principles of large-scale models injected into these uh, scientific problems like simulating complicated systems and get just unbelievable uh, performance improvements and and I'd, I'd love you know your thoughts on that because that's I think it the essence of what you're interested in at the moment yeah absolutely um, so I think I like to um, use the analogy of a sort of a new microscope and in, in a sense we are developing a new microscope for the chemists and the biologists it's a it's a sort of a computational microscope 
Um, and maybe the best way to compare it is with the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where you have particles going around, and the higher energy they produce, the deeper you can look into matter. So the way we are building also a virtual sort of loop in some sense, where we can use compute power to run physical simulations. They are very, very expensive, because quantum mechanics happens to be extremely expensive to simulate. But we can run them, and uh, we, but in the old days, we would then throw away that data. We would look at the results, and we would just throw away the data. Now, the trick is to save all those simulations and to recycle them, so to save them as data, and to recycle them into machine learning models. Now, those machine learning models can then improve the accuracy, but most importantly, the speed of the, of the physical simulations again. And so here you have a circle where it goes, goes around and around. You do more and more simulations. You get more and more data, which improve your machine learning models. And in the end, the whole system gets lifted to become better and better um, to very high energies. And the higher the energy, you know, the more detail you can see uh, in, in, into the molecules. Yeah, and the the thing that's been striking to me is if you pick up a copy of Nature or Science um, over the past handful of years, you are more often seeing people applying exactly this type of machine learning technique to these hard scientific problems, and and they're different. So in some cases, it's quantum accurate molecular dynamic simulation. In some cases, it's uh, you know, getting to a better set of trade-offs for solving Navier-Stokes for, uh, for computational fluid dynamics. Uh, and in some cases, even like their discrete problems, like combinatorial optimization problems, where you know, the only reasonable way to solve them is with a bunch of heuristics-based approximation algorithms, and the deep neural networks are subbing in for heuristics in a bunch of these places. So it's just a really exciting trend, and I feel like we're at early days. And, and to your point, like if you are at a place that believes in the trend and is willing to invest in the compute platform uh, because we believe there are high returns on building these sorts of models, uh, I think we can do all sorts of interesting things. Yeah, I, absolutely. It's interesting you make the point that this idea, this sort of general idea, actually also nicely generalizes to many, many other fields. Another one is, for instance, chip design, right? So people used to design chips with hundreds and hundreds of engineers in the room, and they all wiggle, you know, their, their part of the, they optimize a little part of the chip. Um, and we are seeing increasingly more sort of machine learning moving into this field. And the more chips you have designed, you can start to see patterns in how engineers actually design chips. And then, you know, that feeds back into better designs. And in the end, I think chips will be designed completely autonomously. Um, um, and uh, of course, that's another virtuous cycle where things get better over time using machine learning. Yeah, and I, and I think when you, you, you say completely autonomously, usually what these systems are doing is they are wrestling to ground complexity that is hard for human beings and particularly groups of human beings to deal with. Uh, it's still the case that they are, they're tools, they're sort of like your microscope or a new type of yes. mathematics where you know the humans are directing what the important problem is to solve. And uh, you know, like in the industrial revolution, we, uh, we we never lament that uh, you know, we have forklifts who are you know, taking away human dignity because they can lift heavier loads than a human being. Uh, like, you know, there is a type of cognitive work I think we do that we're going to be very glad that these algorithms can help assist us with. Yeah, it's interesting. I, th I think what's happening is that the humans get to do the more interesting jobs by this, by this procedure. They get better tools to do their jobs. Yeah, and I, I, I do want to double click a little bit on this point around sustainability. So I, I feel like we have a, a bunch of problems facing us as a society where you're going to need exactly these sorts of tools to help multiply our cognitive ability so that we can go solve these things before our time is up. Uh, and certainly sustainability and and uh, decarbonization and renewable energy are uh, one of the biggest problems, uh, maybe the biggest problem that we could potentially apply this to, although healthcare and like some of the things that we're seeing, uh, you know, these tools help us do with the pandemic, I think could be 
just really profoundly transformative to society. Yeah, I really want to focus the efforts in Amsterdam on the sustainability questions. There are so many things that need to be solved in order to make progress on sustainability. Uh, the design of new, uh, say, catalyzers to, for instance, uh, split water into hydrogen or to capture carbon from the air. Um, I think with the new tools, we can enable other researchers to go faster. So I think that's the biggest impact we can make to build the tools for the other researchers around the world to do their research faster and better. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about all of this as well. Um, and and I, I feel like we could talk about this uh, for hours and hours and hours. Uh, thankfully, you're now uh, here at Microsoft, and I think we get that opportunity to go do exactly that over the coming years as we go tackle some of these problems. I'm really looking forward to it, Kevin. Awesome. Well, welcome to Microsoft, Max, and glad, uh, glad to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Likewise. I'm pleased to be joined by the chairman and CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. Satya, thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate 30 years of Microsoft research. It's really great to be with you, Kevin, and also congratulations to MSR and all of the folks at MSR and quite frankly, all of the people who MSR has touched. It's just been an amazing 30 years. So it's great to be with you on that occasion. Awesome. So I, I just wanted to start by asking how you would characterize the impact that research has had on Microsoft and for, for that matter, the world over the past 30 years. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, uh, Kevin, I think a lot about is for any part of Microsoft, but you know, particularly for MSR is what does Microsoft uh, stand for in Microsoft Research? Uh, the, the, the core mission of our company, which I feel is what sort of makes it unique as well as something that we perhaps reinforce with the activity and the work that MSR does each day is we create technology so that others can create more technology, right? That's one, when we say we want to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, it is through their capability and ability to create a future for themselves in an increasingly digital world. That's been true from 1975 to today. It's been true from 30 years ago when MSR was formed to today. But in that context, MSR has been a game changer for Microsoft in many, many dimensions. So for example, the first dimension was even saying, okay, we're not sitting alone. Microsoft is a part of an overall ecosystem of other research institutions, academic institutions. So MSR has been key, key to forming those long standing partnerships with some of the greatest academic institutions doing research and improving, sponsoring uh, their work. It has also been key, one of the things you and I get to see a lot of nowadays is not just Microsoft research contributing to Microsoft products, but our customers' products, cutting it, like the Microsoft researchers collaboration with other industrial labs uh, is another phenomena which is driving the future in different industries, whether it's in healthcare, whether it is in financial services or what have you. Uh, that's another dimension. And of course, inside the company, the impact has been so great. In fact, the human side of it, right? When I look around Microsoft, people who were in MSR, who are leading divisions, who are uh, doing core engineering jobs and innovation jobs, and then also who come from our product groups back into research, uh, the fact that there is such you know, ability for people to move between curiosity-driven research uh, to, you know, basically use case-driven uh, or use-driven research and sort of really create even the cross-pollination between those. It's just been tremendous culturally uh, for Microsoft. I think our level of ambition, our level of success wouldn't have been able possible even, uh, but for MSR. Yeah, so that that is a perfect segue into this Next question that I have for you, which is, we're thinking right now at this 30 year milestone, what the next decade might look like, what we will be celebrating at the 40th anniversary of Microsoft Research and what it has contributed. Do you have thoughts about what your aspirations are for uh, MSR and its research as we think about society's great challenges, about Microsoft's great challenges? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you know, to me, when I think about what is it that Microsoft 
needs to do in order to, as you said, meet the challenges of the world, you in some sense have to get grounded on what's the purpose of a corporation. At the end of the day, we are a business, we are a corporation. So I think uh, one of the definitions I came across now a few years ago by uh, an economist out of Oxford, Colin Mayer, and his book, Prosperity, it sort of really stood out for me because he talks about the pu social purpose of a corporation is to create profitable solutions to the challenges of people and planet. And the key word there being profitable uh, and the other key phrase being uh, challenges of people and planet. Uh, and that's, at the end of the day, what companies have to do. And so in our case, uh, uh, Kevin, I think about all this digital technology, fundamentally, I'm a believer that if it drives broad economic growth across con every country, across every sector of the economy, that will be the best contribution that our company can make. But we also have to be grounded that economic growth that is not aligned with, let's say, the equitable distribution of that growth in any given community or country or society is problematic. Uh, so that's why I care a lot more about the cross-sectoral growth. It can't just be about West Coast to the United States or the East Coast to China. It has to be everywhere. Uh, the second thing I care about, we all care a lot about is how is this helping? Uh, may ensure that the institutions that made even that growth possible are getting stronger, uh, whether it's our democracy or whether it's even the society's sort of long arc towards sort of more inclusiveness. Uh, how are we reinforcing that? How is technology helping? And then the one finite resource we have is our planet. What? How is the growth that is being driven aligned with that finite resource, as well as uh, how is trust? Because technology is now so pervasive in our lives that we need trust in that technology. And so those are the attributes that need to be part and parcel of what we're doing. And that in that context, what even, I guess this, even this week, some of the things that MSR is doing, right? Take that data set around human trafficking and making it available so that there can be more research, more understanding around it. Or, or even some of the great breakthroughs in security and cryptography influencing what we are doing with that election guard uh, technology. Or in sustainability, the work MSR is doing with the city of Chicago. Those are great, great projects for me uh, where we have to, of course, really come up with the next distributed computing paradigm or the AI paradigm or the big you know, user interface change, but also think about these as same, at the same level of priority because I think that's how we achieve our mission. Awesome, it, uh, it's, it's very inspiring to hear. And Kevin, you know, talking about that though, one of the things that I've always looked forward to each year is your memo that you write uh, for us about all of uh, what you see as the not just the technology, but its impact also. So I was wondering, what do you think when you look out? You know, if we say we're reflecting now on the last 30 years, but when you look out uh, at the landscape of computing, what do you see as some of the big breakthroughs that you're excited about? Yeah, it, it is really an exciting time when I look at what the technology trends are and I get to sit down with you and others in, in Microsoft senior leadership team and see what even Microsoft research and their product teams are doing and what our partners are doing with technology. I, I find myself often thinking, man, I wish I was a PhD student again because this would be a great dissertation to go write. Uh, and I think that is, a, you know, just sort of a call to action for Microsoft research and how we think about the risks that we're taking and the ambition that we are uh, setting for ourselves. Um, I, I think one of those big things is AI and, you know, thinking about it not as a substitute for human beings, but almost as if we've been handed uh, an analytical instrument like calculus or the cognitive equivalent of a steam engine and just sort of imagining how we can use it to shape how we solve hard scientific problems and how we create more productivity in the world. Like I think if anything, we don't talk enough about the impact that AI can have. And you know, you and I see this all the time. We've got really exciting advancements in molecular dynamic simulation, which is gonna have this very large high leverage effect across so many different areas like sustainability, drug discovery, um, just super exciting stuff. Uh, like even in the, the 
response that we had to COVID-19 uh, and, and, and the pandemic, there's so many ways that we were using AI to help have a better response. And I think about, uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago, these projects that are in our uh, societal resilience program that Peter has uh, just helped us get kicked off. I mean, it's it's just super exciting stuff. Um, you know, we, we see the AI models themselves functioning as platforms. So, you know, as they've grown in scale, like we've been able to throw this massive amount of computation at them. Uh, and, and the exciting thing to me is not that that creates uh, scarcity, but it creates abundance. So like, I think a lot of people are worried that, oh my, oh my God, I can't afford a, you know, a, a billion dollar supercomputer to train these models. But the fact that Microsoft is able to invest in a billion dollar supercomputer to train these models and the models themselves function as platforms uh, is super exciting. Like we, we get to live this, you know, this dream of, platform building and, and building technology solutions for other people. These models can become the things on which people build on top of. Um, and so I, I think that's just incredibly, incredibly exciting. And then, you know, I, I think we do have to think about how we manage the impact of all of the technical things that we're doing responsibly and ethically and, and making sure that we deliver that uh, you know, sort of inclusive and equitable distribution of the benefits of the technology to everyone on the planet. And and I think, you know, we have some of the very smartest people on the planet thinking about how we can how we can go do this, uh, because like the real tragedy in my mind would be that we decide that because we haven't done the work on safety and responsibility, uh, that we are over constrained in our ability to deploy these technologies to solve these really meaningful, uh, big problems. Um, so I, I've got another question for you, which is, uh, you know, the, so as you look forward into this future, like what are you most excited, hopeful, optimistic about and, and, and why? Yeah, I mean, when I look at sort of even what you just talked about, um, Kevin, and at the end of the day, as as a tech company, uh, one of the things I've always felt is like, okay, what is that order of magnitude, 10x, 100x change that further democratizes the access to technology that then drives that economic growth uh, and, uh, and, and, and just, just general prosperity across sectors and countries. And in that context, I'm excited about three things, you, and you talked about all three of them. One is as a, as a systems company, how are we advancing, right? Starting with the fundamental research. I mean, one of the things people talk a lot about is what is, hey, the Moore's Law may be coming to an end. But the reality, as we know, is as Moore's Law may come to an end, there is new systems architectures that are allowing us to think about computation uh, in richer ways, quite frankly. I mean, some of the AI workloads are driving fundamental rethink, both on the cloud and in the edge. Uh, and so how do we really stay at the cutting edge of that systems research and create ubiquitous computing fab, distributed computing fabric for the world uh, that's just 10x cheaper, 10x more accessible, 100x more accessible. So that's kind of one thing that I'm excited about. The second one is the thing that you talked about. These, you know, we know what's happening with large scale models. Uh, they're becoming platforms. Um, I think that one of the things in the next whatever, 10 years, 20 years, we will hopefully even have breakthroughs on, you know, how does one marry what is happening with sort of the math behind these large scale models with even some of the symbolic grounding? Uh, and what, what would that world look like? In fact, one of the things my ask of research would be that, right? Which is, let us in fact, continue to build the systems and these models as platforms. But what is the next sort of uh, model architecture, or, uh, if I could call it that, that really says, you know, what deep learning has done in the last 20 years or 10 years even? What's that next big thing? I think we're on the verge of something there, and that would be a fantastic area for us to push on. And then the last piece is even the human interface, right? One of the things is we all have done a lot of this 2D video conferencing, right? I mean, 
So one thing that we always obviously bet a big, big on is uh, mixed reality. And uh, I'm excited about sort of what this metaverse may mean uh, for us, because to me, human presence uh, is the ultimate thing, right? When if you and I can sort of actually have this meeting uh, where both of us are co-present without actually being co-present, uh, that's a big uh, breakthrough. So I'm excited about these three areas where there's some fundamental work that's happening uh, in MSR, our partners all over, and uh, you know, I couldn't be more excited about how that translates into products. And so in that context, one of the things I've always been very interested in is MSR, beyond just research that they've done to benefit the company, the partnerships they have forged and the approach they have taken has also been pretty inspiring. And so I was wondering, what, when you think about some of those dimensions uh, around what is MSR's agenda, how do you see it, Kevin? Like, what do you see happening in the next 10 years uh, in terms of even the fundamental approach uh, uh, you know, MSR takes? Yeah, I have really loved research and research institutions for a long time, since I was a teenager and I was benefiting from reading the output of researchers and being inspired by it. And so I, I think just continuing to embrace this enduring spirit of curiosity, openness, and collaboration is really important. Um, I just uh, published a podcast with Peter Lee, where we were even talking about this notion of trust. Mm -hmm. So we we live in a world where the future so critically depends on the research and the technology that we're building, but people have to trust that research and technology in order for it to be used in the ways that society will need it to be used. And so I think us thinking about our role in helping the world trust the technology and even to understand it. I, I sort of feel like we collectively don't do nearly good enough job helping people who are not the deep experts like we are in the things that, that we spend every waking hour of the day thinking about to try to understand and how to bridge those gaps in understanding about the these deeply technical things and how they're impacting their lives. Um, I think another thing as well that, uh, you know, Peter and I chat about a lot is how we encourage people in Microsoft research to take the risks that they are uniquely positioned to take. Um, so th the, the purpose of having a research organization isn't just to write papers and to go to conferences. It's to have an ambition to do things that are either because of time horizon or because of the uncertainty and whether or not you're actually going to be able to successfully solve the problem that you tackle these things nonetheless because the payoff when you make these new discoveries is potentially so high and so I I believe this my entire career. It's the reason I stopped actually being an academic. I thought I wanted to be a college professor from the time I was 16 until 30. And then I, I left academia because I, either rightly or wrongly, felt like I wasn't able to take the sorts of risks that would produce the highest sorts of impact. And I, I want to make sure all of our researchers feel like they're not just empowered, but they're being encouraged to take those bigger risks, because if they're not going to do it, then who who is really? Um, and then, you know, I, I think you mentioned earlier, um, like these two very key issues. One is impact. So like we have all of these uh, issues like when is the next pandemic coming? What do we do about global warming and decarbonization? Uh, how do we deal with the proliferation of misinformation? Like how do we use technology to strengthen the institutions that have enabled us to get to where we are right now? So we have a big role to play in that. And I think part of uh, our job in fulfilling that responsibility is thinking about partnerships. Um, so there are things where we are the world's experts and we have the expertise and the capital to go do things. Uh, but a lot of these problems are increasingly becoming fundamentally 
uh, interdisciplinary uh, that require us to partner with people who have expertise and ambition that we don't. And, uh, you know, if you look at OpenAI or the Broad Institute or like any number of these scientific partnerships that we have, they are bearing enormous fruit. And I, I think there's an awful lot of potential for us to do more of those sorts of high ambition things with partners. So um, it, it's been, you know, as always, like an honor to uh, hear how you are thinking about Microsoft and Microsoft Research and our role in the world. Uh, as I just want to thank you for your time today, and uh, you know, I'm I'm glad that we get to work together on creating what the next ten years of Microsoft Research might look like. So thank you so much. No, thank you so much, uh, Kevin. And I thought sort of your last answer was just pretty inspiring. I mean, the ability for us to work together with our partners in creating more trust in uh, innovation and in technology and in science, uh, and then couple that with increasing levels of, I would say, investment and risk tolerance that we can have, and then bring even, perhaps even the academic partners and other research institutions alongside us uh, to drive that innovation. And lastly, as you said it so well, uh, the getting ahead of the unintended consequences of the technology even, uh, I think is absolutely uh, the right vision for MSR for the next 30 years. And so, you yeah, know, one thing that I always think about is people in MSR and in research in general, you know, to take that William Gibson line, uh, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. That's kind of where research is. Uh, but the interesting thing is for research also to think about as it gets evenly distributed, uh, what is its impact? Uh, because things are, like all things, are path dependent. And so uh, us as researchers and as tech companies can put things on a path that have increasing returns that are positively aligned with our society. And so that's, I think, what you know keeps us uh, all going and excited and energized. So thank you very much uh, to everyone in MSR and congratulations uh, again uh, on your know, great 30 years and looking forward to the next 30. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. What a great couple of days. So many thought-provoking discussions and sessions. We hope that this event has given you a sense for where we are today, of all the progress we've made across science and technology, and of all the work we have ahead of us as a global research community. To ensure that future advancements in technology benefit everyone, it takes everyone. We've reached the end of the summit, but hopefully a starting point for new projects, collaborations, and directions. Thanks again for attending, and we hope you'll stay connected with us. See you next time.